The XY Advisor podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, Drummond Capital Partners Proprietary Limited, ABN 15622-660-182, AFSL number CAR 0012600050 of AFSL 334906 and is limited to publicly available information. General advice may be provided by our sponsor, but does not take into account your objectives, financial situation or needs. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. XY Advisor does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Welcome to the XY Advisor podcast a global community of financial advisors sharing and learning with one another to drive the positive evolution of financial advice. To get involved, go to xyadvisor.com or simply download the XY Advisor app. Drummond Capital is an independent, institutional-grade investment manager passionate about supporting businesses with the implementation of managed accounts. While the growth in the sector has been significant, many businesses are not reaping the benefits. Understanding the journey and partnering with a truly independent business who is focused on achieving success for the advice practice is critical. Partnership is at the heart of what Drummond does, from investment management to client servicing and communications to business strategy support. Hello and welcome to this XY Topics podcast. My name is Fraser Jack and we all know change is hard. And in the last few years, there's been plenty of it. However, if we have a process or structure and understand the long-term reasons why we're doing it and we treat it like a project, then change management becomes a lot easier. In the series, we take a deep dive into the 12 steps to implementing managed accounts into an advice business. And we hear from a fantastic panel of speakers, Simone McMullen, Principal at Annex Wealth, David Maloney, Director of Event Guard Financial Group, Melanie Bennett, Executive Director at CFS, and Tom Sherbert, Managing Partner of Drummond Capital Partners. Now, this is the first episode in a series of four. So if you have already done the math, you may be thinking that we are covering three steps in each of the four episodes, and you would be right. In this first episode, we highlight step one, assessing what you are doing now and what you stand for. In step two, we look at the catalyst for change and understanding the moment when it's time to make a decision to change. In step three, we look at knowing where you want to end up, you know, from 12 months to now, from now all the way through to 20 years from now. There are so many great tips here from people who have been through this journey before. So let's kick this off with the first three steps in the process. Thank you for joining me today, Simone McMillan. Hello, Fraser. How are you? Wonderful. Thank you for being here today. We are talking about uh, uh, the journey that you've taken along uh, with your practice and particularly the decision making that went into the managed accounts um, and introducing that into your practice. Uh, Before we do that, give us a quick overview of of you and your business. Yeah, sure. Annex Wealth, we're a self-licensed business based in Melbourne. Uh, We have eight people in our business, four and a half of them are advisors. So I happen to be the the half a person who's half advisor, half responsible manager and looking after the compliance and process side of the business. Um, We came out of the um, bank uh, network. So in 2015, myself and uh, one other advisor started Annex Wealth and we've grown then by bringing on other advisors from that same same network. So grown today, seven years in, looking at providing advice predominantly in the wealth management space, uh, but also across personal insurance, aged care, business insurance, centering strategies, estate planning. So really, you know, the holistic advice piece. Yeah, wonderful. And we're going to explore a bit of your journey today as we step through this uh, sort of 12-step process on decision-making. Obviously, a lot of decisions 
go into making, uh, you know, when you're starting your own business and and, um, and we'll probably get to step two in a, in a minute where we talk about the catalyst for change, which was coming out of the existing structure. Um, but I guess as you started your business uh, and we go through that, that conversation of, um, you know, looking forward and looking at what sort of a value proposition, I'm, I'm assuming that you and your business partner got together and then worked out what it was, you know, that what you wanted to do, who you wanted to serve and how you wanted to serve them. Yes, definitely. For us, it was definitely being able to focus on ongoing advice. We felt that, you know, where we had come from, there was this constant drive for um, bringing on new clients. And it was really important to us to be able to provide value to our clients for the ongoing service that we provided. And we felt that we, we weren't able to focus on that. So that was a big driver. In terms of the investment piece, it was really important to us. We started the business in 2015 using a managed account um, as our investment service. And that was really important to us. So where we were previously working, we were advisors were building their own investment portfolios. And we saw that as a quite a flaw in terms of advisor efficiencies and the ability to grow a business within a business. So, you know, you sort of hit a number of clients that you can service and that you can't grow from there. But also, secondly, just in terms of the outcomes that we were able to deliver to clients, we felt um, that we couldn't bring our best to the table. So that from the outset, that was quite important to us. This is a really dis- interesting distinction because sometimes we talk to people and they're thinking, I really want this, I really want this. But, but often it comes from a place of we now know what we don't want to do. Mm, definitely. Definitely. We've seen these things happen. We've seen these. We, we, we know the feeling that, that it's like when you're just constantly hunting new business and you don't get to have that ongoing relationship and service. Uh, and so that's sort of for you guys that really come out of that, what all the things you didn't want, tick those off to start with and then start thinking about what you do want. Yes, exactly. And we wanted to be, I suppose, within our own business so that we could control the destiny, our own destiny, and also shape the advice experience for our clients rather than, uh, I suppose, be be told how that needed to look. We felt that, you know, there's, there's, as I mentioned, there's four and a half of us involved in the advice side of the business and, you know, combined there's sort of 80 years experience there. And we felt that by that point, we understood what clients were looking for and we wanted to build that for ourselves. So when we first left um, the bank environment, we were licensed through a boutique dealer group. So we acted as a corporate authorised rep. Um, And over time, we did know from the start that we wanted to be self-licensed, but we just felt that it was important leaving that big environment. We still wanted that backing of a a feeling of a dealer group. Uh, But in 2020, we actually uh, obtained our own AFSL and that then it was a further catalyst to, to even um, get even better and, and I suppose improve on the managed accounts journey as well again, which was which was interesting. It's been an interesting couple of years on that on that path as well. And interesting is exactly what we're trying to uh, get to in this podcast. So we'll be digging that information out of you as we go through these uh, these uh, twelve steps. Just just one more thing on the you know what you wanted to do when you worked out what you wanted, how you wanted to serve your clients, did you then also work out with your partner the size of business, the, the future, the history, the bit, like how you want the business to grow over the next year? Did you have a forward plan? We definitely did and we do still have one. It does change and evolve and we are constantly updating that. Um, we need to, but we, we in fact have a 20-year business plan. So this was really important to us because when things go wrong, which they invariably do, and things that you just don't expect or anticipate, even though you plan within an inch of your life, think things will happen. So, but sitting back and reflecting and saying, well, how does that then impact on our 20 year plan? That's been quite helpful. So we did know exactly how we wanted it to look. Um, and, and that has been of help through the process. Yeah, so if you're thinking 20 years out all the time, then it really makes the short-term decisions quite easy. Yes, definitely. Or I should, I should say easier. Mm. Thanks for catching up on this first step. Let's jump in to the second step. Thank you for joining this conversation, David Maloney. Thanks for having me. Now, let's give the listeners a very quick overview of you and your business at the moment. Yeah, sure. Look, I'm one of uh, four directors at uh, the JPH Group. Uh, we're a multidisciplinary practice. Um that specialize in accounting, uh, wealth management, obviously, uh, mortgage broking, uh, commercial insurance, and also uh, legal, a law firm. Wow, fantastic. And what, t- tell us about the size of that. How many, uh, like there's, you're, in your financial planning practice side, how many people? 
Yeah, so within our wealth management business, we've probably got about uh, seven to eight staff. Um, we're looking to add a, a couple more. Uh, Melbourne, we've got about 30 staff and about 10 uh, interstate and also um, overseas as well. Wow, fantastic. Um, and, and when was that started again? <laughs> it's been, uh, there's a bit of background here. So the business is approximately 35 years old. Um, our portion of the business, when we merged, uh, probably started about 15 odd years ago. Yep, fantastic. Yep. So we've got a, a, yep. a rich history to get through uh, as we have these conversations. <laughs> uh, now today, today we're really focusing in on sort of a change management process within a within a practice, um, yep. and specifically in that you know the, the, I, I wanted to run through your journey around how you decided to and, and went through the process of working out, you know, to, to bring managed accounts into the business um, as you sure. would with, with many of the projects you've probably run within the business. But I guess let's, let's start with that. Let's start with um, sort of the beginning for you. You're running a practice. You're not using managed accounts. Um, yep. Let's start with a little bit of the history of your business um, as you, as you went through that process. And then when you started thinking about um, what, what you were going to do. Sure. Uh, I'll, I'll talk a little bit of myself just for a moment. I was 22, um, looking to start a financial planning practice, um, very green behind the ears. Uh, and our start date was 1 July 2007. So it was the peak of, I guess, the mining boom at the time. And of course, after that, we, um, we experienced the global financial crisis. Um, some of the scar tissue from that was a, a sense of feeling that, you know, our advice process, our investment process, um, we didn't have the answers at the time, right? So keeping that context in mind, um, we wanted to go down a journey of introducing um, really quality people and best ideas into our investment process. So we started looking at managed accounts approximately uh, five years ago um, with a view that um, we could engage an MDA licensee, um, also a third-party provider, as well as an asset consultant that could give us really quality advice tailored to our client demographic um, that also separated us from our peers, ultimately. So that was the kind of the thinking roughly around five years ago. Um, since then, uh, we rolled out our first investment programs um, in the managed account space roughly about three years ago. And we've had a lot of turmoil since in the last three years. So that, that's been a fantastic process. Um, our communication with our clients are just so much better now. Yeah. So that's a bit of the history there. Yeah, yeah. So we'll, we'll jump into the story without getting too far ahead of ourselves. Um, of so just just quickly on that um, on that decision that, that we're, as you're making it, was there anything that you had to have in place? You know, you mentioned it sort of took a couple of years before you went before when you started the journey, but before it actually rolled out. Take me back to that very beginning. What was some of the, the I guess, the values that you wanted to align with when it came to the the, the reason why you decided to do that? Yeah, sure. I mean, there's a few things to unpack there, but um, at, at the time, five years ago, we didn't know who the players were. We didn't quite understand um, how they worked and who the key uh, or what the key inputs were um, in that whole process. So there was a bit of a journey there, a bit of understanding, uh, a big fact-finding mission. Um, we did create some collateral around this. We called it the Portfolio Project. It was really where we went on this mission to really understand how can we manage money better. So that started approximately five years ago. And you know, even to this day, we're still learning things, but we, we feel like we've got a really strong grasp of everything. In terms of who we decided to um, partner with, we were trying to find someone that were not to be to include some kind of nepotism, but someone that was similar to us, right? In, in the sense that they were business owners, um, they were tied to what they were doing, um, they were accountable to us. So we really wanted that accountability piece. In the past, we have used things like um, you know master trusts and multi managers, and you kind of you get given what you're given uh, and there's no real accountability there. Um, so what we wanted to do is flip that uh, responsibility chain and say, look, you're responsible to us and our clients um, as custodians of our clients' wealth. And we wanted to ensure that there wasn't this high turnover of staff with our third-party providers. Thank you for joining me, Melanie Bennett. Thank you for having me. I find it wonderful to have you along. Now let's start. Let's start with a very quick overview of who you are and how you fit into our profession. 
Absolutely. So um, I've been lucky enough to work in our profession for about 10 years now, started in advice and then I moved over to the product side about six years ago. So I've spent the last six years of my life um, in platforms, BT and now CFS, and um, really specializing in uh, change management, transitioning and implementation um, for advisors. Fantastic. So you are the perfect person for us to speak to uh, because we are talking about uh, change management. We're talking about a change management process that advisors go through uh, when they're thinking about uh, making major changes to their businesses. And uh, I'm sure you have plenty of great stories, success stories and horror stories to share. So I'm looking forward to getting stuck into them. Absolutely. Yep. Got, got a few on both sides. Fantastic. Uh, no names, of course. Um, so let's uh, <laughs> let's uh, let's dive straight into this concept of uh, of a change management process because um, at the beginning of any sort of major shift in the business, people sort of put projects together, they work out what they want to do. But I guess it always it starts with that concept of initially just a a small seed of an idea of you know is this or could this be or something. And, and what are your thoughts around how people start a, a major change process? Is generally just around somebody said something or an idea or, you know. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. I found there's often a couple of different types of firms. Um, some firms are consistently looking for or consistently scanning the market for what's now available to them, you know, as technology and things advance, what's now available to me that used to only be an in store level or high net wealth level, what can I tap into? So that's definitely one um, cohort of advisors that kind of get to this space. Another cohort that I think is, you know, nothing's kind of broken. Everything's going okay. However, they're aware of it. They've heard good stories. They've heard something. There's some other type of catalyst to change. And while nothing specifically broken or there's no immediate urgency, they're starting to look at it. Then there is the cohort where there is an immediate urgency. So you're kind of talking about, you know, that quadrant where we're talking at important and urgent, important but not urgent. So people come from these different quadrants depending on what's happening in their practice. That's a really good way of it. That's a really interesting way of looking at it, isn't it? Important and urgent. And that, that's not just an interesting way of looking at it from a practice. That's an interesting way of looking when advisors think of their clients as well. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. And I mean, I think we all know how busy everyone is, the compliance burden. No one's got time, right? But if you're constantly working on the fires, as we know, then we're never in that quadrant and, and never moving the dial. Yeah, I was just, I was really interested in what you said around the style of uh, uh, an advice practice, you know, those that are constantly looking for improvement yeah. and, and always looking versus those that are like, don't mess with it. It's not broken. Don't try and fix it. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's some really innovative advisors. I've met some practices and I'm just completely blown away, you know, and I think it's from their mindset in some way and they're just removing the, you know, bias in their own minds about how hard some things are to do. Just removing it, just being curious, a little bit open-minded, and then they start tackling and adopting new tech and new ways of doing things and they end up with really incredibly effective and efficient businesses. Yeah, yeah, exactly right. Now, I just wanted to quick dive into the step one because we're talking about sort of the concept of that that initial mindset, which exactly mm -hmm. what you just brought up, um, and then thinking about you know from say from a values point of view, um, you know like what's what's the process going to be? Do I want this? Is it something I want? How long is it going to take? I mean, I guess there's a lot of sort of questions that go through somebody's mind when they're thinking about making a major change. Yeah, absolutely. And I think one of the things I'd say in this is just be really truthful with yourself around this, right? Because the, a change management process is most effective when you're actually addressing the real obstacles, the real risks. So, if you're not being clear, you know, what am I actually trying to achieve here? Am I doing this from the back foot where I've got to quickly get to something to uplift revenue, to sell, whatever it is? Just be honest about what it is. Think about what you're trying to achieve here. Yeah. And, and it could well be possible that the real obstacles are the advisors themselves. Yes. And often, and that's okay. I mean, I'm, I'm an obstacle in a lot of things in my life and that's okay, but we just, you know, once we get there, then we can overcome it. Yeah, exactly right. Excellent. Mel, thanks so much for catching up on this first step. I'm looking forward to diving in the, the following steps with you um, when we get to them. Great. Thank you. Thanks for joining us, Tom. We are talking about the 12-step change management process that, uh, well, not just for managed accounts, but that all advisors go through when they're looking at making major changes within their businesses. Firstly, thank you. Welcome to the conversation. Would you like to give the, um, the, the listeners a quick overview of yourself? Thanks, Fraser. 
Yes, I'm the co-founder and managing partner of Drummond Capital Partners. Uh, we're a boutique investment management business focused solely on the managed account sector and, and providing you know, asset allocation and holistic portfolio solutions to, to advise businesses. Um, prior to that, I was a you know, partner, head of research and advisor within a large private wealth practice. So I've um, got experience crossing the advice um, spectrum as well. Fantastic. And of course, uh, the whole profession has been through a lot of change lately. Um, and this is a, we, we're going through a change management process, but uh, give us a bit of an overview of some of the change that you've seen going on um, within the whole, um, the whole profession. Absolutely. I mean, it's been a period of profound change. You know, the bank's exiting advice and advisors, advisors are either leaving altogether or, or moving to sort of smaller licensees or, or becoming independent. Um, but either way, it's, it's not enough for advisors now just to provide advice. Um, they also need to be business owners. And that's a skill that doesn't come naturally to all. You know, there's many mis- decisions to make uh, on that journey. What, what's your operating model, staff, technology, advice proposition, and of course, investment solutions. You know, if I reflect on our own business journey, um, when we started in 2017, you know, one of the observations we made was that most of the asset consulting you know, services in market were bottom-up fund research driven. And, and you know, we believe advisors should get away from selling funds and, and refocus on total portfolio objectives. Um, and that means focusing on asset allocation. So we build an institutional grade asset allocation service. You know, the second observation for us was that many managed account solutions had been built, but unfortunately not widely adopted. And, and again, we wanted to provide significant sort of implementation and practice management support you know, so our clients do gain the efficiency dividend. So we focus our business on these two key pillars and, and outsource all other functions such as, you know, retail product issuance or administration. And I guess we adv- encourage our advisors to do the same, like focus on their core competencies, you know, understand your value proposition and, and outsource and partner with those specialists that can help you in other areas. So, Tom, obviously, you know, you've spent time as an advisor, but, you know, starting your business, I see a lot of similarities between a, a practice owner going through the changes in their business and some of the, the things that you've been through um, with de- with building out your business. Do, do you see those similarities? Absolutely. I mean, we're working in a sort of reasonably new part of the industry and we're trying to solve solutions to, to help businesses become more efficient. And, and really in this age of specialisation, you know, we've focused ourselves on a, on a competency that we have that, that we enjoy doing um, and that our clients, you know, seek to, you know, to gain our insights from. And so we're an investment management business. All of our activities are focused around that in the same way that our, our advisor clients are focusing on being, you know, the best technical advisors, providing that service and, and client engagement piece. And so, you know, specialisation and partnership are, are really important. Now, Tom, you mentioned confusing and confronting, and it absolutely is, a, I guess, a huge area where advisors could be overwhelmed with with decision making. Um, what what are the sort of things that they should be at this first step of the process focusing on, rather than I'm thinking maybe it's not about just choosing who and partners and what you want to do, but actually what you want to stand for. Absolutely, I think first and foremost, really breaking it down in its simplest format. What do you think it is that your clients actually look to you for? And, and recognising, I think, in, in the role as advisor that you can't be an expert in every one of those fields. And, and, and then essentially, you know, when you break it down so simply, um, you know, focusing all your attention and your efforts in the areas that you really do have the, that sort of core competency and skill and, and then seeking to go out and find, you know, specialist partners for the areas in which, you, you, you know, you, you need to get assistance for and understanding that, it's okay. Your clients are going to understand that you're not an expert in in every facet of the of the business, um, and I think that in itself, you know, partly leaving the ego at the door, um, can be quite a liberating process because it does allow advisors and again to build a more efficient business, uh, and, and to think about you know the way in which they deliver the advice with, with the client at the centre. Yep. Now this is a uh, this is this is leaning into this concept can be quite confronting for advisors because if they've done this before in the past and they've hang their their hat on their expertise in this space, um, sometimes it can be a little bit of uh, you know surrendering that and saying um, saying to their clients or their existing clients that they whilst they used to do this in the past they are now you know maybe not the best person to do that in the future. Yes, in some ways, I think absolutely that that's the case. Uh, and again, it's just it's coming back to ultimately the advisor-client relationship is one of you know enormous trust. Uh, and and in the end, the clients just want you to be the source of truth and the source of information. And and even if you are not 
ultimately responsible for producing that. In our case, you know, all of the investment related, you know, communication, content, and ideas. Um, but but ultimately, you're you're the responsible party for delivering that information to them and helping them to understand and, and helping them stay on track. Uh, that's what they're looking to you for, and that's you know that's where the trust comes from and continues to build. And so. It's absolutely okay to say, do you know what? I, I'm not the expert in this area, um, and I've brought in specialist resources because I think it's in your best interests. And, and I think most, in the end, that that decision and that conversation is liberating, and I think it's enlightening also for the client to understand that as well. Yeah, it's probably not. Um, it's not a new conversation because obviously a lot of advisors are having that conversation uh, with clients. So that, you know, anybody that's thinking about this wouldn't be the only person that that's ever happened to. Um, and uh, and so obviously with some of what you've seen, has that been a conversation that's been you know maybe confronting for advisors to have? But once they do, they they mm. feel liberated. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, I think it enables them to focus on what they want to do, and it comes back to that that whole concept of trying to build. You know. The, the practice of the future um you know what does that actually look like what makes you want to go to work every day you know is it happier clients is it happier staff you know is it more referrals you know is it richer deeper conversations with your clients uh on the things that matter on the technical advice on you know engaging with the next generation and their children uh, all of those things that, that's that's really what the, the goal uh, i think should be for most advisors and so um, once you get back to the to the core of that, um, you know, removing the things that, you know, potentially were distracting to you achieving those um, is really, really powerful. In this second step, we talk about the uh, the catalyst for change. And in, and in your journey, it really was around, um, there was two sort of catalysts for change there. There was obviously the change of getting out of the, the banking system and creating your own business, which was obviously a huge um, setup. And then you had a second catalyst for change uh, when in sort of 2020 when you got your own license. Do you want to talk us through those two moments in your journey? Yeah, sure. So um, when we started Annex Wealth, we used managed accounts. So uh, as I mentioned, you know, coming out of that bank environment where advisors were building their own investment portfolios, that was the norm. And we saw, you know, really big flaws in that process. So advisors unable to be efficient and unable to build their client base, but also importantly, the outcomes for clients. So what we saw there were delays in implementation. So clients were waiting for their annual reviews with their advisors before investment changes were implemented. So that could mean, you know, you could have a client base of 200 clients and 25% of them get changes done in one quarter and then that just you know translates across the year so that was really a poor client outcome unfortunately for clients they were unaware that this was happening so for us it was really important to be in an environment where we were transparent and authentic with our clients that was really important to us and and so moving and setting up our own practice we felt gave us that element of, of control to be able to give all clients a similar outcome which which we thought was was sort of not not happening from the environment that we came from. In your in your journey, I feel like there's a lot of um, whenever we we make these decisions or, or you know there's the tipping point. There tends to be the there was a whole lot of stuff that happens and it gets worse and worse and worse and we finally pull the trigger on that tipping point. Was that quick for you guys or was that something that you know you had to take a lot into consideration? Uh, we took a lot into consideration. So we spent sort of eighteen months to two years building the foundations of the business before we actually took that that plunge. And in terms of starting with the dealer group that we started with, it was again another 18 months of, of pre-planning and building towards obtaining our own license. The the pitfalls, so what we thought um, we had in terms of the managed account solution that we moved to, the the setup was that the dealer group actually operated the managed account and they also acted as the portfolio manager. So during our experience with that and also at the same time, I, I think we need to keep in mind that the industry is changing and evolving as we go as well. So a lot has happened since since 2015. It continues to happen. But we just saw on the horizon playing out um, the fact that clients were looking for separation of product versus dealer group versus investment manager. And that we felt that was important to clients as, and was going to become even more important, as well as being of great importance to regulators. So we decided that in stepping away and starting our own AFSL, it was really important to us to then take the learnings from our, you know, 1.0 of managed accounts and really improve on that in the second, second phase and say, okay, we now would like to look at separating the managed account operator from the portfolio manager, from the advice provider. So in doing that, 
phrase it to answer your question. <laughs> your point was, yes, it did take a long time to uncover that and to go through that process of discovery around how do we actually make this happen. Yep, fantastic. And uh, and was some of that conversations around, you know, obviously there's different parts of that conversation. Um, how much of that was around the concept of, you know, this uh, business efficiency around, you know, valuations, um, you know, those sorts of things, thinking about this from a business point of view, um, not just from the, you know, how do we look after our clients the best we can point of view? Look, from an efficiency perspective, we really felt that if we didn't continue along this managed account path, there was always going to be a ceiling at which the business could grow. So it was all, it was for us, it was about how do we, how do we move that? How do we get advisors doing what they, what we believe they're good at, which is being the strategic advisor, uncovering the client's goals, working with the client, keeping the client accountable. How do we get them focused on that instead of focused on building portfolios, which we don't believe is their expertise so and in by doing that you're then allowing the advisor to grow in terms of how many clients they can service so it was it had a couple of facets to it um the end outcome is that the business we believe that the business has a higher valuation because of that um but that was more so an outcome rather than our main our main driver Welcome back, Dave. We are talking about the catalyst for change in a lot of this decision-making process. Uh, let's go back to your story. Tell us what your in, in your practice, what was sort of one of those main the reasons for you actually deciding that this is what we're going to do and pulling the trigger? Yeah, so uh, look, it was probably client-driven, to be, to be frank. Um, so, and also, coincidentally, the Royal Commission was going on at the same time and we did really want to take that opportunity to um, get something that could set us up for the next, you know, 20 years really as a business. Our client demographic um, quite loosely uh, tends to be pharmacy practices, um, barristers, medical professionals, people that tend to be self-employed and and traditionally have been outsourcers of their um, finances. So there was a real uh, I, I guess yearning within our, our demographic and client base to have something of quality, right? And something that we could say, you know, as custodians of, you, you know, your wealth, we, we have a real control um, and oversight um, of that for them. Um, so that was the, the main driver of it. In, ter- in terms of some of the key decisions around things, especially an asset consultant, who do you partner with? There's so many out there. Um, we, we did land on a particular uh, asset consultant, uh, Drum and Capital. Um, we really felt that they understood us as a business. They understood the advice process. And in terms of the, the communication that they could provide our clients, uh, the insights, it really was aligned um, to our clients. But that, that was a, a long process. We, we spoke to many others. But that was the the key uh, thing that we were looking at at the time. Yeah, and certainly the Royal Commission had a lot to do. There was all of a sudden there was a lot of um, the spotlight was on the advice firms, and they were uh, you know certainly answering a lot of questions to clients. Um, Now, just you you mentioned the long term plan. I'll I'll get onto a bit more of that at the the twenty year plan. That's a it's a great thing, Um, and and dealing with professionals, of course. Um, just with that, um, I'm just going to ask you: What was your licensing situation at the time, and has it changed, or was it, you know, was it part of the? Yeah, part? spot on. So, look, it's a it's a quasi um, model at the moment, but look, we were uh, self licensed at the time. So, when we did start this journey, uh, we were self licensed. Uh, we have since given that license up. Uh, a bit more background into our firm: We are partnered with uh, AZNGA and. Uh, a strategic view was that we uh, would partner with an external AFSL um, and we currently use that uh, AFSL today. Um, but a key requirement was to accommodate our investment process and, and the way um, we run that. Um, and they've been more than fantastic um, around that. But yeah, you ultimately can set these things up. doesn't matter um, whether you're self-licensed or with a dealer group, um, it's obviously possible. Mel, thanks for joining me again. We are talking about the catalyst for change or or, or a decision-making process, something that goes on uh, in an advisor's mind when they actually make the decision to pull the trigger. Uh, what, do, what are your thoughts? Yes, I, I often do think there is a catalyst for change. As I said, there, there is a cohort that I think proactively looks for improvements, but often, you know, in a very busy world, you're very time-constrained, you know, 
everyone's hunting for your attention, something happens in your business that makes you look at how you can become more efficient and you end up doing your own fact-finding process, your own RFP process, looking at it, how can I make my business more efficient or how can I bring XYZ capability from a professional manager into my business because someone's retiring or we've got too much diversion in our returns. You know, something is happening in your business that makes you look at this. So I think there's usually a friction point within the business that gets you to the point you're looking at, you know, a change. Yeah. And a lot of advisors I've spoken to there, when, when something happens like this and they, they make a change, it's because they, they've hated something or they really want something, but there's like, there's, there's either some sort of, you know, towards or away from motivation that just gets to that tipping point. And, and sure, it could be external. There could be a change in licensee or, or an external factor that goes right now's the time to do it because I've been thinking about it for too long. Um, but you know, what, what are some of those things that you see in, in, in advisors when they go, right, it's time. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, definitely changing licensees or, or you becoming self-licensed, moving dealer groups, acquiring selling practices. Often there's also a point where you've had a few key stakeholders in the business that have been involved in the investment decisions going forward and previously, sorry. So going forward, I mean, to reduce your key person risk here, they're looking for succession planning, et cetera. How do we address that? Increasingly as well, you know, advisors have an incredible amount of tasks that they've got to be across and they're doing a huge job of governing these portfolios. So I think with all the education that's going on in the industry, they do get to a point where they're like, well, what would that look like if I brought someone in to help that, right? Um, how could that enhance my value proposition? And, and eventually, once they start going down that pathway and start doing their own research, they get to a point where they're like, okay, I can see how this works. And once the light bulb clicks, boom, it's all systems go. It's pretty much like that, isn't it? Turning the light bulb on and uh, it's like, bang, why didn't, why didn't we do this to, uh, two years ago? Oh, I think there's a lot of, you know, I said there's a lot of research and a lot of education going on in the industry, but I mean, there's also a lot of confusion I think there's a lot of different structures. You know, how do you go about this process? How do you find a manager that you want to work with? How do you pay them? How do you do all this? So there's an element of confusion, I think, and just, oh, I don't know. Therefore, I just won't start. Yeah. That also stops. So once you get through that, you're like, ah. It's very easy not to make a decision when the, mm. the, all the decisions are overwhelming. So I'm keen to I'm keen to dive into that point a little bit later in the chat. Yes. But um, I just wanted to say for now, we, we might um, um, end this point and we'll, sure. we'll catch you in the next step. Tom, step two in the change management process is really around the the concept of a lot of people decide to change or um, you know make the decision to to do something about this. Um, and generally, there's a catalyst, or sometimes there's a catalyst for for what that moment is in time. And um, you know, in all decision making, there is a point or a tipping point of when we actually make the decision. Uh, what have you found to be within you know your observations around the advisors that have made this decision um, the, to be the catalyst for change? Sure. So obviously we see the statistics on the number of advisors leaving the industry and I think advice industry at large has had its moment and those that are left uh, now realise that they need to build a better business, build a stronger advice proposition um, and and often that catalyst might be now they've, they've moved out of a large institution um, by choice or because the institution no longer is in advice. Uh, and they've either set up, you know, under a dealer group or they've set up their own license. And so uh, they now, you know, with that business owner hat on, realise that they, they need to work out the way to, you know, efficiently and effectively and equitably deliver, you know, strong advice solutions to their clients. And I think those that have, again, that have stayed, uh, they've been put under enormous scrutiny. Um, the, the new, you know, procedure and standards of, and code of ethics um, you know, re really make the advisors rethink the way in which they're delivering um, advice. Um, and, you know, product is getting harder, investments are getting harder. Uh, and and the need to, to gain that business efficiency uh, that in order to give them time essentially to focus on uh, focus on the clients and giving stronger advice, um, you know, is, re is really important. Yep. Uh, that, so there's obviously been a lot of... Um, uh, external triggers, I guess, or external catalysts for this change, whereas, you know, people are moving and therefore have to make a decision, have to change the way they're doing things, have to change their documentation, whatever it might be. But um, but for some advisors that are remaining 
or haven't changed that sort of stuff, um, you know, should they be also looking at this and, and thinking, well, do I actually need a catalyst to change or am I ready to just make a decision? I think if you've made the decision to stay now, you're, you're thinking still with ha- having gone through five years of, of pain and change, I, I think all the advisors that certainly we're working with today have got a mindset as a business owner of, you know, 10 or 15 year horizon of how to build that the best business they can and how to maximise the value of that business. Uh, and, and, you know, if they're going to do that, then adopting best practice across all areas of their business is, re- is really important. And so, and the strong, more profitable, you know, stronger businesses are ultimately going to deliver better advice solutions as well because they're going to be better resourced. And I think that's that's really critical. It's not a cottage industry anymore. Um, scale is, you know, was was too much in the institutions, but it's not, you know, you also need to generate some scale in, within a business in order to deliver, you know, best practice as well. Yep. Uh, now you mentioned uh, maximising valuations there, of course. And if you if you if you've got some a profitable practice, then obviously they're worth more. So I guess if people, oh, you've probably seen this, but people are preparing to leave um, the profession, then they could also be doing this to to maximise the value of their business. Absolutely. Yeah. I think in the end, a more efficient business should should have higher margin, um, but also you know having centralised and efficient business model, whether that's through managed accounts. Um, we've seen evidence in, in other markets. So Australia is really reasonably early in its adoption profile for, for managed accounts. And we've seen, you know, the UK had their Royal Commission about five years prior to us. Uh, the US has been on, you know, a similar trajectory really since 2004. And so they're a more mature stage of this process. And we're seeing valuations on businesses that have gone down the efficiency path or gone down a similar path around managed accounts you know, being valued at, at much higher multiples than the traditional wealth businesses that they've left behind. And so I think in the end, back to that sort of those that have realised they're staying for now and are committed to the industry either to maximise the value of the sale of their business or, or to grow their business into the future, um, you know, know that they need to adopt best practice now or, or be left behind uh, as the rest of the industry does so. Thanks, Simone. So step three of the process, we're looking at really the conversation around understanding what you want this business to look like in the long term. Now, you mentioned you have a 20 year plan. Talk us about, talk us through that and and how, uh, you know, what your long term prospects of the business is in your 20 year plan. Yes, sure. So we have four equity owners in our business and Two of them, we have a 10 year age gap. So, so two of us are in our late forties to early to pushing 50 and the other two are 10 years behind. So our business plan looks at having a, a retirement or an exit runway for, for everybody in, in that business. So we, we've built in providing older partners a pathway to exit as the business grows and evolves and younger partners and new people coming into the business, the ability to take on equity. So, um, that, that was. You know, quite quite important to us from the start in terms of having an ability to realise some of your equity along the way, um, as well as attracting and enticing new new advisors and, and new people into the business. So just just on that, this is this, this sounds really interesting. Is this like the um, the legal or accounting model where you you have equity in the business, but you can other other partners can come in and and sell your equity along the way, and there's a consistent valuation methodology? Yes, definitely. Yes, that that's exactly exactly what we've done. I guess that's clear and transparent then to every single person in the business as to what the value of the business is. Uh, interesting point. Uh, I wouldn't say every single person in the business. We do want to get there, but because we have a combination of advisors and support staff, we haven't yet shared that level of information. But our intention is that for we believe that everyone in the business is a critical person in the business. For example, our youngest person in the business has been with us for five years, so been with us along most of the journey and we we have commenced his professional year and looking for him to understand what the long-term ability is for him to have equity in the business as well. So it's it's a bit of a project, um, but so we sort of started with the founding partners, so to speak, and then we've we've sort of spread that out across the business. Yeah, it seems to me that I could say it's a, it's a great way to entice people that are looking for that long-term career though isn't it it's if people want to come in you, you're like you're finding the right partners not just employing advisors and 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 they may move on in a couple of years you're 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 looking for people for that really that that long-term 20-year plan 
Definitely. Yes, definitely. And I think clients are looking for that as well. You know, the environment that we came from, we had feedback often from clients that every year they turn up and they've got a new advisor in front of them. Um, we've never wanted to give our clients that experience. It was really important to us when starting the business that if a client comes on board and they're a client of Simone McMullen, that that's the advisor that they remain with. We then want to build support teams around those advisors to help them deliver that advice to clients. So, you know, ultimately, um, you know, we, we used to think we could only have a hundred clients per advisor with the managed account solution. We feel we can get that to about 150. And, and from there, even further to the 200 mark, we'll be building in associate advisors and support teams to help that advisor deliver the advice to the client. So, but just making sure that that is consistent, that that's our aim based on the feedback that we've had from clients over the years. Thanks for joining me again, David Maloney. Um, now, last time we um, we were chatting about the, the previous topic, um, you mentioned the concept of long term plan and, and that over that twenty years. Uh, and and t- tell me about how important that is for you and your business, and how it's part of this decision making process. Yeah, uh, I mean, if you look at our management, um, we're relatively young, probably um, when you compare us to uh, typical firms. So we're all in our late thirties to early forties. And if we want to do something for the rest of our careers, we need to have a 20-year plan, I guess. Um, but to break it down, we do have uh, short, medium and long-term goals. The long-term goal, uh, obviously, is that we, we want to be a fantastic practice that our clients are advocates for. How that looks exactly, we're still unsure. Um, it's a bit like the early explorers. You know something's out there. But not until you do it, do you kind of get a better, clearer idea of what you're trying to achieve. Um, In terms of the the short to medium term uh, goals, we are looking to acquire quality businesses um, that we can integrate into our practice. Um, We're fortunate that we're talking to several at the moment. And we hope that we can successfully uh, execute those, not only to initially merge them, but integrate them as seamlessly as possible. That's where managed accounts are really important to us um, because it really does provide that back end uh, support and we can better integrate practices into our business. Yep. Uh, now, I want to just quickly go through again that um, that decision-making process we talked about. There was you know, the mm-hmm. catalysts around there, but um, I want to talk about the longevity or the having that 20-year plan and how that pr- can provide clarity around the decisions that are made today obviously if you're just thinking short term there's lots of you get into the weeds and you but when you start going that 20 years you go okay well that's the direction we want to head in yeah exactly so uh some decision making we're making is not for short-term profit um we're making some long-term investments and that's centered around technology efficiencies better client experience um as well as partnering with the right um third parties Sometimes you only get one crack at these because unwinding them um, can be extremely costly and distracting. Uh, yep. So if we do a lot of that groundwork up front, spend the right level of capital, we believe it will save us a lot of money uh, yep. down the track. And that also includes partnering with good quality people. If we've got the right infrastructure and we get good quality people in, into our business, they're more likely to hang around as well. Yeah. And you you and I have previously spoken around the concept of each part of your business having uh, a something, you know, like a, a something that s- sets itself out from the crowd or stands out from the crowd? Spot on. So we look to have an edge in every business line uh, and something that kind of distinguishes us um, from our peers and competitors. So uh, as a clear example, um, in our mortgage space or lending space, we, we do have favourable policy that we can obtain um, with some lenders. Um, and that's something that we, we can articulate quite clearly to our client demographic and it's something that they really appreciate. Um, we often get clients off the back of that and then um, into other areas of service. Uh, we also wanted something and, and the key to that success was actually clients became advocates um, for our business. Um, we wanted something like that within our wealth management business where clients could really see the benefit without us really having to prompt them and they become advocates uh, of that service. Fantastic. Uh, Thanks, Dave. I look, I really want to ask you a few more questions about articulating that clearly, which, which is really important, but I'll do that in the next section where we jump in and start talking about the investment philosophy. Yeah, great.
Mel, thank you so much for joining us again. We are talking about step three in the change management process where we start to think about, you know, a bit of planning and, and, and where we want to be in the long term to help us make some decisions around the process. Yeah. I mean, this is a really good step. This is a fun step, I think, if you sit down and really do it. I mean, what do you want your business to look like? And you've got to be really unconstrained in your thinking. Like, really, what do you want your business to look at? There's no nothing stopping you getting it. Um, but this is a really good step as well because as you're going through the process, there are quite a few steps involved in this and, you know, change is difficult. So having a clearly defined vision of where you want to get up, where you want to end up, what you want your business to look like, um, what you want your clients to be getting is is really powerful for when you're in the midst of it. Yeah. And when you're working with businesses in this space, um, what if they're sitting there with a blank look going, I don't know, what should it look like? <laughs> Usually when you ask this question, though, they're trying to fix something. So instead of, but instead of looking at where they want to end up, they're just going, where do I not want to be now? But where do you want to end up? But it's almost like they're scared to look that far. Like it's un- unachievable, but it's just not. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. I guess some. I guess th- there's certain. If you can look far enough out, that makes the decisions now pretty simple. Yeah, and I mean, there's a lot of there's a lot of efficiency and a lot of change that your business can get through this process. So putting yourself in that mindset of like, okay, if I have that, what does my client relationship start to look like? What does my profit line start to look at? You know, how how are my staff interacting? Yeah, the funny thing about this is that it's difficult to do, but then it's the same position that uh, many advisors put their clients in when they start talking about what, are they, what, what, they, what do they want their retirement to look like. That's a really good point. I hadn't thought of that. Yes, really good point. It's always easier to be on the other side of the table, I think. Yes, very true. Good point. <laughs> always be the, it's always easy to be the one asking the questions and the one coming up with the answers too. Very uh, true. But, but you are right though. I think people ought to start, if it's starting with that, where don't you want to be is not a bad spot. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, process of elimination, right? (laughs) It's not here. And then sometimes you work through it and you get to the blue sky thinking, but my encouragement is just to really think about how you do want to run your business and what you do want it to look like. It might not be as out of reach as you think. Yeah. And when, and when you do that, then I guess the next part of this process is to really think about the numbers and work out what the profitability margins are and, and the, you know, the, the valuations might be, you know, for the long term but, you know, exit Absolutely. plan or exit strategy for the business. And you, you need to have KPIs that you're tracking yourself to on this because you need to see the wins. It's important. You need to see how your business is actually tangibly chaining. If they're not measurable, how do you know you're hitting the mark here? Yep. Yep. Fantastic. Excellent. So uh, any uh, any massive tips in this space for advisors sitting down and thinking about their, you know, what, are they, what they want to be when they grow up? <laughs> I'd say it's a great activity to do with your staff as well. Bring them along the journey. Ask them what their pain points are. You know, what do they want their day to look like? Yep. And and then you've got some KPIs that your whole firm is tracking into and then you've got everybody bought into this change process. So I think it can be really fun. Make sure they're measurable and I'd bring as many people in through the process as you can. Make sure you're just documented well because it's a very good tool to refer back to. Yeah, I think that's a really good tip to, you know, reach out to people around in and around the community like yourself or, or even your peers and just say, you know, what, what are the ideas or thoughts or what, what could the future business look like? Absolutely. Now, Tom, in step three we, uh, we of the change management process, we're really looking at, you know, where do businesses want to end up? And, uh, you know, this is, a, this is I love this part. It's sort of like starting with the end in mind, uh, a great little principle of, of working out, you know, what could be the end game uh, for a lot of these businesses, um, you know, when you're making this decision or going through this change process. Talk to us a little bit about what you've seen in advisors, what goes through advisors' minds when they're thinking about what their, their end game might be and, and why this is such an important part. Yeah, absolutely. Back to the consideration, I think you're no longer an advisor, but also a business owner. And when you put your hat on, you, you realize, well, okay, how am I building the value of the, the asset which you're investing so heavily in? And, and um, it has, means having a really close understanding of what it costs to serve your clients and, and what revenue you can generate. And, and if you're not doing that efficiently, we see across the industry some pretty – uh, interesting or unfortunately sad statistics in that the estimates from you know from Treasury, I think KPMG's done a report that the the cost of advice um, per client is is ahead of actually the average revenue per client, and so we really need to look at you know better ways and more efficient ways to deliver that advice. And if you come back to again your core competency and value proposition to your clients and 
clients are coming to advisors for superannuation advice, for that technical insurance advice, for tax structures, for the wealth planning, uh, and and anything that's not a core competency within that, which you are not essentially charging advice fees for, in a way that's where you should be focused on outsourcing. And if that's investment management, which again we believe is a you know a specialised uh, profession in its own right, if you're able to outsource some of that capability um, and and ultimately then focus on providing better advice in the areas you're, you can actually charge your clients for, then hopefully that means that you, one, are delivering a better outcome for your clients and two, are actually you know, generating a, a positive margin uh, on, the, on the advice process, which unfortunately at the moment, the industry on average is not uh, and, and it's a problem that we all need to solve for. Yes, exactly right. Now, sustainability is obviously the first step and then profitability comes after that. Uh, you've obviously seen a lot of businesses go through this process. Uh, is there anything that you've seen coming out of the other side as to how much more um, profitable or, or sustainable they can become um, versus, you know, say, you know, by, by the time you add these efficiencies and to the business? Yeah, absolutely. I think when we started the business, one of the observations – of the industry was that managed accounts uh, were getting designed at a practice level uh, and sort of left within the business like another product. And and our view was essentially that it needed to be a more holistic investment service that really we didn't believe the efficiency dividend for the business would be realised until north of 80% of the practice was using and the clients were, were using the service. And the reason is that you, if you're going to take it away and say a managed account is not a product, it is a service, then actually what you need to do is rethink the whole way in which you deliver investments to your client base. And so it's not just one thing to say, well, here is a solution for a segment of the client base, but the whole process needs to involve assessing, well, how am I actually going to deliver investment service to those clients where the managed account is not suitable? And so... Having seen all of that, we spent a lot of time, you know, with our clients up front trying to understand the different segments of their client base uh, and and how they're actually going to cater to the whole client base, noting that we will not manage the the investments of the whole client base, but we need to help the practice solve the solution. Uh, And and so what we've, you know, what we've developed over time is is support for them to get to that point where we've seen our clients cross that sort of 80% threshold and they've finally reached that efficiency dividend piece where, you know, the reviews are all done uh, on a quarterly basis, regularly and consistently for their clients. Uh, their staff satisfaction is greater because they're more focused, again, on value-adding advice processes rather than investment-related administration. Uh, and they've got capacity with, you know, the anecdotal numbers are like 30% capacity now within their business to go out and, and grow. And, um, you know, and that's ultimately what they're, they're trying to do. How are, how are practices solving for that? You know that those clients that don't, or the, the maybe the the the, the solution is not ideal for. How are they solving for that at the moment? Are they sort of um, re- reducing the size of their client base, or are they still working outside of the managed accounts? Yeah, I think that's it's really interesting. So I think it starts from the premise of how you're actually going to present the the new service, if you will, the managed account service to your clients, and it's not a yes or no. It's actually taking stepping the client through. The decision for that you've made as a business to adopt the service in that you know markets are obviously moving a lot faster than they used to um, cost of delay ha- having the discretion within that structure is really important and then the features that come along with you know the scale advantage and the delivery of that efficient advice for the end client uh, understanding that they will have best ideas implemented equitably when the market dictates uh, not when the advisor meets at review and once you explain the process to them then the client can say well but if they still want to retain control through the traditional advice process and consent essentially to all the changes then the, then arming the advisors with one a solution for that so maybe a more static uh, long-term you know lower frequency of rebalance style arrangement and and actually encouraging them to price that accordingly so it comes back to understanding your cost to serve if the only way in which those clients uh, can have their portfolios, you know, changed and rebalanced is via the traditional ROA or SOA process, understanding what that looks like, explaining it to the clients, and then having them decide that that is actually the path that they want, and and paying for that advice accordingly. And so, it's actually making sure the clients are clear on how you need, how you as a business deliver investment solutions, and not hiding behind that. I think that's absolutely okay because in the end. The, the client will ultimately choose, oh, do I prefer to be in the efficient path that you think is best practice, that you think is best for me? 
if you're not and you want to retain that control, then what are the implications of that, both from the advisor's perspective but also from the client's perspective and then ultimately letting them make the decision. And in the end, that's how, you know, taken on the right journey, the clients have said, actually, we, we want to adopt your best ideas, um, focus, and, and really got to that north of 80% uh, level. Yeah, there's some really interesting points you've just brought up there, which we'll probably d- dip into a little bit later around uh, control. Um, you know, the clients having control or trust, I guess, is the is the thing. Uh, but not only that, the advisor also has to um, uh, think about control versus trust um, in, in a relationship as we get on. So uh, we'll, we'll, get, we'll get to that in one of the other steps. But uh, for now, Tom, thanks for being part of this particular step. <laughs> 